We've been told that this is quite a dangerous bear that's been known to attack people. Hi guys, um, so this is my first video vlog. The Taco Liberty Bell? Yep. <laughs> Odorama card! Good evening. Approximately seven minutes ago, at 6.53 p.m., the Space Needle collapsed. Bummer about the needle. Mm. But wait until you hear what's happened to one of the most cherished symbols of American freedom. This is part three of the hoax's iceberg, where we have been diving deep into the hoax iceberg that was created by Silent Chatter on Reddit. And if you haven't seen the first two parts, don't worry, you don't need to, but if you're a true fan, then you would. Today we are descending deeper into the iceberg with some more obscure, strange, and disturbing hoaxes. Let's get into it. And I just wanna clarify, this isn't booze in this glass. It's like some kind of like fruit juice cocktail thing, but just imagine it's booze. It's the only way we're going to get through. Back on April 1st, 1983, a newspaper called the Durand Express in Michigan reported that a strangely named chemical called dihydrogen monoxide had been found in Michigan's water pipe. They reported that inhaling this strange substance would nearly always result in death and that it could also cause severe blistering of the skin. But dihydrogen monoxide is actually the technical name for water. Now there have been multiple iterations of this like water is poison hoax from over the years from a parody organisation called the Coalition to Ban Dihydrogen Monoxide which was created by a bunch of students in the early 90s to a website created by a man named Craig Jackson in 1994 which claimed that the American government had refused to ban this toxic chemical but it was a 14 year old science project that really got people talking about dihydrogen monoxide. So Nathan Zona actually got people to sign petitions to ban this substance for his project titled How Gullible Are We? And the answer, it seems, is very bloody gullible. Ban it from school? Yeah, ban it from school. We have it at school? We do have it at school. <laughs> oh yeah, then we should definitely we ban should it. Ban I don't want to die. Do you know what dihydrogen monoxide is? Yeah, you said it burns people. It's water. In its gas state, water can burn people. It's in acid rain because it's water. Why are you trying to trick me now? Although, in the case of towns like Flint, Michigan, the water is literally poison. <laughs> I have no doubt that most of you watching this video have seen this photograph of a tourist standing on the top of the World Trade Center with a plane in the background. Now, it's obviously a fake, but many people spread it around the internet claiming that it was real. And it was a photograph of Peter Guzli, who was a Hungarian tourist, and the photograph was actually taken in 1997. Now, after the events of 9-11, Peter edited the plane into the background and sent it round to his mates. You know, it's a bit of banter, it's all it's supposed to be, but obviously, the people that he sent it to must have sent it on to somebody else and then it takes on a life of its own and suddenly it's everywhere all over the internet. He became a very early meme with websites set up in late 2001, photoshopping him into all manner of other catastrophic events including JFK's assassination, Oklahoma City, Godzilla and my personal favourite, speed. Interestingly, a man named Jose Roberto Pentado, who was a Brazilian businessman, claimed to be the tourist guy, obviously seeing his opportunity to score some clout. And he got interviewed a bunch of times and he was even offered to be in a Volkswagen TV advert, which is mental that Volkswagen, just a few months after 9-11, thought, you know what, like, let's get that tourist guy in an advert. Time and time again in this series, I'm absolutely baffled by humanity. <laughs> The story of the Cardiff giant begins with a man named George Hull, who was a tobacconist, he made cigars, and he got into a bit of a debate with a revivalist minister about Genesis 6-4, which says there were giants in the earth in those days. Now, George Hull had a good eye for a money-making idea, and the biblical passage inspired him to create the Cardiff giant. In 1868, in Fort Dodge, Iowa, George Hull hired a stonecutter to carve a five-ton block of gypsum into the statue of a giant. He made 
made the stone cutter swear not to tell anyone that he had carved the giant. And he also used various different chemicals to make the giant statue look like really old, like a relic that he'd dug up. Overall, the hoax cost him $2,600 to create, which is around $51,000 in today's money. Which is a lot of money for a very risky investment. He then shipped the giant to a farm in Cardiff in New York, where it was buried in a pit. And then in 1869, the farmer hired workmen to dig up the spot where the giant had been buried the year prior and thus it was found. Now in true entrepreneurial spirit, they put a tent over the giant and charged people to come and look at it. And it was bloody popular. They ended up jacking up the prices almost immediately. Obviously the discovery of a petrified giant got the attention of geologists and it was first examined by a geologist called John F. Boynton, who came up with a theory that the giant had been carved by a French Jesuit in the 16th or 17th century to impress Native Americans. Then a a paleontologist from Yale examined it and he called it a most decided humbug. It's basically the 1800s way of saying load of old tosh. George Hull ended up making $23,000 from the hoax when he agreed to sell it. And our favourite racist hoaxer, P.T. Barnum, wanted a slice of the action and he offered to buy it for $50,000. But the blokes that bought it off of George were like, nah mate, this is our cash cow. But in classic Barnum fashion, he decided to make his own. In 1800, in 1969, George Hull came forward and declared that the whole thing was a fake. He spilled the beans on everything. And the Cardiff Giant is still on display today at the Farmers Museum in Cooperstown, New York. <laughs> Back on April Fool's Day in 2010, an online shop named Think Geek put out a strange advertisement for a new tasty treat, canned unicorn meat. It was just a novelty item. It was something that you'd find in a joke shop. But Think Geek went a step further and used the tagline, the new white meat, which was remarkably similar to the trademarked tagline used by the National Pork Board, which is the other white meat. Honestly, the things I have to say on this channel. Now, because it was similar, the National Pork Board sent Think Geek a cease and desist because of course they did and Ceci Snyder of the National Port Board I'm sorry those are some of the funniest words that I've spoken on this channel Ceci Snyder said we certainly understand that unicorns don't exist yes it's funny but if you don't respond you are opening up your trademark to challenges in all seriousness these animal agriculture boards are packed full of capitalist swine who are more concerned about fake unicorn meat and selling as much pork as possible than and they are about people like Renee Miller who have to live near the waste lagoons of the pork industry, subjecting them to all manner of health conditions. Sorry, we're getting political, but fuck the pork board. <laughs> Koala bears, the sweet looking marsupial that lives in Australia. Big fluffy ears, strange but cute nose. They're adorable, right? Wrong. See, according to legend, there is a particularly carnivorous species of koala bears that attack those without Australian accents. Say hello to the drop bear. So drop bears are a close cousin of the koala, but they're actually really vicious. So it's, it's sort of like a, a dingo and a, and a normal domestic dog. Um, they're bigger, they've got longer claws, um, they've actually got really small fangs and the interesting thing about the fangs is they have a really um, mild venom. It's, it's not like a, a snake venom that can make you really sick but it just causes a lot of really um, local irritation. Alright, I'm just going to flat in. Okay. Oh, he's fucking yours now. Okay. Yeah, just okay. No, no fast Okay. Yeah. Nice and steady with the, the yeah. bear. Yeah. 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 And um, keep them calm. Yeah. Everybody looks same. very, You're very worried little. about this. I'm trying not to be worried because I'm being told that he can sense if I'm worried. Now, drop bears don't exist. It's a particularly hilarious pastime of Australians to trick non-Australian tourists into thinking that there's like these rabid bears that are going to drop from the trees and like absolutely wreck you. One of the earliest written accounts of drop bears was in the Canberra Times in 1982, but it's been around earlier than that. I remember my grandma spent a lot of time in Australia and she would talk about like spiders that would bite you when you go to the toilet and she basically banged Australia as like this land full of dangerous wildlife which isn't not true but it's also a bit of an exaggeration. There's this ad for Bundaberg rum that shows a group of tourists being targeted with the hoax by a bunch of Australians as a ploy to get them to join their camp. Jeez I uh, wouldn't camp there for you. There's drop bears. 
Tropez? Uh, yeah. Like a, like a yeah. bigger, yeah. meaner uh, koala bear. Koala. Yeah. Ooh, then yeah. they drop from the tree. I guess drop bears are in the same category as like jackalopes and other more humorous forms of cryptid. They don't really have the same level of believers as like a Bigfoot or a Loch Ness monster. But either way, be careful when you're in Australia. Here's where things get a little bit dark and here's where some of the code wording begins that I'm sure you will love. Now, red rooms are a myth, but many will swear blindly that they're real with very little evidence. But obviously that doesn't stop people when it comes to building up salacious conspiracies or hoaxes, as we've seen. Now, am I saying that this kind of content doesn't exist? Like, absolutely not. We know, unfortunately, that it does. But that doesn't make red rooms real. So what are they? Type the words into YouTube and you're gonna get a bunch of varying content from people that start their videos like, what's up guys? Welcome back to my channel. Here's some torture videos. Red rooms claim to be a live streamed paid for service on the dark web where viewers can interact with what's going on. and and what's going on is murder. There have been so many moral panics about the dark web and all of the things that go on there, but arguably the regular internet has just as much dark and horrific content. Like I literally remember watching beheading videos when I was like 13 in IT class. The thing about red rooms is there's no first hand evidence and a lot of the stills and stories that people put forward are often like creepy pasta type content or people just making like weird art projects. But YouTubers will continue to mine this hoax for content, putting dark and scary music over the top of videos that show apps absolutely nothing to elicit fear and intrigue out of the person watching. He's doing obviously something in the bowl and he's holding something, he's mixing it and it, it, it looks like he's doing some sort of ritual it seems like and that's definitely creepy and you can see that the only lighting in this room is just from the candles and I don't know and then oh my god look at and he just zoomed up on this that's so creepy it almost looks like there's two heads coming out the sides of this cross and then the video just cuts the myth has definitely been helped along by hollywood with one of the earliest iterations of a red room type story coming from the 1983 film videodrome television is reality and reality is less than television and later peaking with films like Chatroom in the 2000s. But like I said before, sadly, if you want to find disturbing content on the internet, you don't have to go to the dark web. In the 1950s, the Cooper family moved into a new home in Texas. They took a photograph of the mother and the grandmother posing with two children at their dining room table. Smiling, happy, totally normal. Until they developed the photograph and saw what looked like a hanging body next to them. How could this be? This is such a stupid one. Essentially, the photograph was uploaded onto this website on the 14th of November 2009. And the story about the family, also not true, at least not verifiably. It appears to be like a creepy pasta type story and the figure next to the family was most likely added when it was uploaded to the internet. But some people on Reddit like to claim that the photograph isn't photoshopped and that it's a hoax from the 1950s. But again, there's little verifiable proof of that. But I will say that the family all appear to be squished to the right of the photograph, which does leave space for the fallen body to appear on the left side. So it's definitely possible that this was an inventive 1950s hoax. Who bloody knows? There's a pineapple under the sea. Smile, smile, square and yellow and porous is he. One thing that I never knew was just how many people are fascinated by lost media. There's tons of YouTube videos dedicated to the topic. There's subreddits, iceberg charts, the whole shebang. And I do kind of understand it because there is nothing more exciting than the idea of finding something that you thought was lost forever. But sadly, in most of these cases of lost media, either the media doesn't actually exist or it really is gone forever. A Day with SpongeBob was a mockumentary of SpongeBob distributed by Regal Films. And the premise of the film is that SpongeBob lives above ground like all Hollywood superstars. Afraid that SpongeBob is becoming old news, his boss runs a contest called Spend a Day with SpongeBob. The contest makes SpongeBob the talk of the town as thousands of kids enter to win. 
The lucky winner is Seth and he is ecstatic about his day with SpongeBob. However, the day becomes a roller coaster ride as things do not go quite the way they planned. Sounds great. It sounds like a delightful unauthorized kids movie. And as far as I can ascertain, A Day with SpongeBob first appeared on Amazon and it had a release date, but the release date was missed and it started people going down the rabbit hole to find out what happened to it. Now, some people claim that the film was available available for a day which led people to assume that it was still available to find somewhere. It was YouTubers that really made this popular with Blame It On George making a video and another YouTuber called Rebel Taxi making one as well. People were spreading all sorts of rumors about what this film was about. Some people making up fake reviews saying that it includes violent content and hoping that it stays lost forever. Another YouTuber called Bedhead Bernie managed to track down the supposed creator of the film who was a guy that went by the name Mr. Orange, obviously borrowed from Reservoir Dogs. And apparently he wanted to make like this John Hughes-esque movie about SpongeBob. And he was like pitching the film to see if there was any interest in it. And he also ended up releasing five pages of the script, thus basically confirming that the film's script did exist, but it had never actually been made. This is such a strange one that people got like really obsessed with, but whatever floats your boat, I guess, I don't judge. Oh, uh... Seattle is the home of everyone's favourite radio psychiatrist, Frasier, the birthplace of grunge and home to the Space Needle. There's obviously a lot more in Seattle. Those are just the things that come to my mind first. The Space Needle is a big tourist attraction. It's one of those things that you go and you see it once and you're like, oh, there it is. And then you're done. You never need to see it again. But on April Fool's Day, 1989, King TV, which was the local station for Seattle, broadcasted a terrifying announcement that the Space Needle had collapsed. We interrupt our regularly scheduled programming for the following special report. Good evening. Approximately seven minutes ago at 6.53 p.m., the Space Needle collapsed. Information at this point is incomplete. We do know that injuries are minimal. Fortunately, the needle was nearly empty when the accident occurred. A maintenance man who was working on the lower level has apparently been taken to Harborview's emergency room for minor injuries. It was part of a sketch comedy show that was called Almost Live, which interestingly launched the careers of Bill Nye the Science Guy and Joel McHale. I actually saw Joel McHale jogging on the path leading up to the Hollywood sign in LA back in like 2018. And that man has like really rich looking skin. Like his skin was just like screaming, I've got money. And I don't know if that's a weird comment, mate, but I'm going to leave it in. Anyway, the Space Needle hasn't collapsed. It was very obviously an April Fool's Day joke. And the footage literally said April Fool's Day. But apparently the police got a whole bunch of phone calls from locals. And obviously it's important to remember this was 1989 information obviously wasn't as widespread as it is now so you couldn't just text your mate and be like have you seen the space needles still up i was walking i was walking along mercer here and i heard this sound it was like thunder and i i looked up and it was swaying and it just it was and it just it went over it just it was it was like somebody just kicked the bottom out from under it you wouldn't believe it apparently over 700 people called the space needle itself to find out i can't even imagine how annoying it must have been to work the phones on that day. Almost live, we're forced to issue an apology and the whole thing blew over eventually. But I did find this great clip from a trashy movie called 10.5 where the space needle collapses due to an earthquake and I'm just gonna show it to you anyway. Personally, I miss the days of chain emails. You remember when it was all like, forward this on to 10 friends or else something terrible is going to happen to you. 
You know, like the kind of gentler days of the internet. Nowadays, all I get are fake sponsorship opportunities and princesses whose dads have died and now they need my help to access their fortune. But back in 2003, a very interesting email hoax began to be circulated. It claimed that Earth is catching up with Mars in an encounter that will culminate in the closest approach between the two planets in recorded history. Mars was going to look as large as the moon and you were to share this with your children and grandchildren children because no one alive today will ever see this again. Now part of this email was true in that Mars was as close to Earth in 2003 as it will be until August 28th 2287 but the confusion actually arose from the sentence at a modest 75 power magnification Mars will look as large as the full moon to the naked eye. Now when we look at the email we see the 75 power magnification part is in very small writing and in the big Big writing is Mars will look as large as the full moon to the naked eye. Humans are stupid. We hear what we want to hear. So instead of hearing that Mars enlarged 75 times will look as big as the moon, we focus on the end of the sentence and then look like absolute idiots when we're staring up to the sky trying to find fucking Mars. <laughs> YouTubers are the worst. As a YouTuber myself, I feel like I can say that. There's a section of people on this site who will do just about anything for clicks, clout and AdSense money, from poisoning themselves to making people fight for cash to planting fake bombs to terrify people. Meet Troll Station. The content on this channel is lowest common denominator. The so-called humour is usually derived from either terrifying people or mocking marginalised groups like trans women. So obviously it's got a huge amount of subscribers and millions of views across their videos. But the clout chasing backfired when their cameraman, Dan Van Lee, also known as Digi Dan, was arrested on suspicion of placing a bomb hoax eight times. He was put in prison for nine months and he said, a big production for the Jackie Chan movie blew up a bus in London in February and didn't warn anybody apart from some local people. In a way, that impacted more people and scared a lot more people, but a small production does this low-budget thing and this is how it is dealt with. Somehow, I don't really think they're the same. I mean, I'm not a big advocate for just throwing people in jail and I think there probably could have been a better way to handle it than like locking him up for nine months. But it's really arrogant of a channel like Troll Station to call themselves like a, a low budget production when they're just a trash YouTube channel. And the co-founder of Troll Station, Dan Van Lee, may now be facing a prison sentence over this prank where a suitcase was left on the pavement in Lambeth and Southwark last September. He placed an article, namely a briefcase, at various locations. I'm very, very, very worried for him. We all know there's a serious chance he could go to prison for it. The Channel Troll Station isn't that popular anymore, and I'm kind of glad about that. Although this kind of content still thrives on platforms like TikTok, with those absolute assholes that fight workers in supermarkets for some unknown reason. <laughs> Currently oh in the stock room. Oh Actually, I don't know why I'm saying that. We all know the reason. This kind of content gets millions of views and it requires the least amount of effort and work to produce. You don't need to make anything informative or worthwhile. You could just go and start swinging at people that make minimum wage in the middle of a pandemic at Tesco. Two cheers for the creator economy. What would you do if you were just chilling, watching TV, living your life, and all of a sudden an emergency alert came on declaring a zombie outbreak? Now, I don't know about you, but I would probably pass out and shit myself. And back in 2013 in Great Falls, Montana, that actually happened with a threatening message about zombies hijacking the audio of an otherwise harmless teleshopping ad for a pancake maker. I mean, like an emergency alert. I'm not sure if they like shut themselves and passed out. I'm finished with my drink now. I'm just going to put it down. Civil authorities in your area have reported that the bodies of the dead are rising from their graves and attacking the living. Follow the messages on screen that will be updated as information becomes available. Do not attempt to approach or apprehend these bodies as they are considered extremely dangerous. I repeat, 
Civil authorities in your area have reported that the bodies of the dead are rising from their graves and attacking the living. Follow the messages on screen that will be updated as information becomes available. It was a hijacking of the emergency alert system, which is a national warning system that basically allows the US president to address the public in case of a national emergency. Obviously, there weren't any zombies, but there were other hijackings across TV stations as far as Michigan. And to this day, I don't think they figured out exactly who it was. But investigators believe the origin was somewhere other than the United States. Luckily, the police said that they didn't get any phone calls about it. So this attempt at creating a panic fell completely flat. I'm so, so long, Mr. In the day YouTube was a bit of a different place. It wasn't all makeup tutorials and true crime or people giving away large amounts of money in a garish spectacle. There were a ton of people that used the platform for making a video diary. And some people do still do that. There's a lot of great people that just vlog about their daily lives. Now Lonely Girl 15 appeared to be one of them. She popped up on May 24th, 2006 with a strange video about dinosaurs, followed by her first ever video blog. Hi guys, um, so this is my first video blog, um, I've been watching for a while and I really like a lot of you guys on here, um, my name is Bree, I'm 16, um, I don't really want to tell you where I live because you could, like, stalk me. But here's the thing. Brie wasn't actually real. She was a creation of a company called Equal, who were creating a fictional web drama. And at first, everything seemed believable. She's filming these video diaries and we get a glimpse into her life and her friends. And then things take a sharp turn when we find out that Brie is actually part of a secret cult called the Hymn of One, which is the religious arm of an organisation called The Order. The story behind The Order is that Alistair Crowley once visited the Temple of Hathor, where he discovered that there was once a woman considered to be the living fountain of youth. This woman went on to have children, and apparently it's like a sacred bloodline, so Alistair Crowley decided to track them all down, and he created The Order. Obviously, this is all fictional. The web series shifts from a vlog style to something more reminiscent of a drama, when Brie is selected to be part of a ceremony for the hymn of one but she finds out that it's basically a front for the order that are looking for what they call trait positive humans basically humans from that sacred bloodline so yes it's a hoax in that the original web series was designed to be real and this web series was hella popular back in the day which is surprising now because you go on like the youtube and it doesn't have that many views but it did have a cult following and people would analyze every single detail trying to find out if it was real or fictional. People were tracking the story and each new development. They were talking amongst themselves, trying to figure out what was going on. This kind of storytelling is still hugely popular on YouTube and everybody loves an ARG. I think my favourite example of this kind of storytelling is probably Marble Hornets. Oh my God, I was obsessed back in the day. Also, an incredibly popular one at the moment is the Monument Mythos series, which I would recommend checking out if you haven't seen it and if you are a horror fan. The Liberty Bell is probably one of the most iconic tourist landmarks in the United States. Now, it's not my personal favourite. That one is Hole in the Rock in Utah. But people love the Liberty Bell. And back in 1996, Taco Bell decided to take out a full page ad in seven of the biggest US newspapers, including the New York Times. And the advertisement read that in an effort to help the national debt, Taco Bell had decided to buy the Liberty Bell and rename it the Taco Liberty Bell. They also hoped that it would prompt other corporations to take similar actions to reduce the country's debt you know, instead of paying a decent share of corporate income tax. Corporations already own the names to many of our national traditions. Tonight's NCAA men's basketball finals is at the Continental Airlines Arena. I think corporate sponsorships uh, are the wave of the future in many things. Philadelphia Mayor Ed Rendell seemed pleased with the deal. I am a Taco Bell consumer. Until the company said the bell would be moved to its corporate headquarters in California. But first, the Taco Liberty Bell will go on tour starting here in Atlanta for the Olympics sometime after 
April 1st. Obviously, it wasn't true, but this was printed in the New York Times. And this was back when people still had a bit of faith in the media. So a lot of people believed in it. Apparently, thousands of people called the Taco Bell headquarters and the National Park Service in Philadelphia to find out if this advertisement was real or not. How much did they get for it? The company would not say. Well, that's a slap in the face, isn't it? And you know what they say? No such thing as bad publicity because Taco Bell's sales allegedly increased by $600,000 the next day and the entire stunt apparently banked them $25 25 million dollars 25 dollars that's nothing 25 million dollars of free publicity If you're around the same age as me, then this one is going to be a bit of a throwback. I remember hearing that Marilyn Manson got his lower ribs removed back in school so he could like, you know, you know where this is going. Interestingly, rumours around rib removal have quite a long history and a lot of it has to do with the pursuit of an hourglass figure. And a lot of rumours circulated back in the Victorian times that women were getting their lowest ribs removed to create like a smaller waist. In the modern day, Amanda Lepore is alleged to have had her bottom ribs broken and pushed away to generate that hourglass figure. But Marilyn Manson didn't do this for aesthetics. I mean, he didn't do it at all. It's totally fake. But the idea of a celebrity doing this for non-aesthetic reasons was actually first attributed to Prince. The idea of doing certain acts to yourself actually seems to stretch all the way back to ancient Egypt. A very long and interesting history indeed. Now, Marilyn Manson went as far as to address the rumours by saying, What people fail to understand is that the strange character I play on stage is exactly that a character. In real life, I'm just a regular guy, not the kind of depraved weirdo who would permanently alter his own body to suck his own now, I would argue that recent developments prove that Marilyn Manson is indeed a depraved weirdo and that removing his rib might have been the least harmful thing he ever did. And let us not forget everyone's favourite expert on just about everything, Joe Rogan, said recently that he was able to do this act on himself. And I'm wondering if that's one of the side effects of being hopped up on Alex Jones's super male vitality pills. If so, get it on the label. Dr. Group's help, we have developed the ultimate male vitality supplement. This is the answer to the globalist war on male vitality with the estrogen mimickers they've added to the food and the water supply. It feels like so many entries on the hoax iceberg are just people having like a bit of a laugh and then it's like people with no rational thinking skills and no sense of humour that start panicking and huffing about everything. And that exact thing happened back on April Fool's Day in 1980 when the BBC Overseas Service decided to report that Big Ben was swapping its famous clock face and going digital. The radio broadcast went as far as to say that the clock hands would be given away to the first four listeners to call in and people didn't find this very funny apparently there were some angry responses and i can imagine it now because there is nothing that british people seem to enjoy more than getting outraged over absolute bollocks and if you want some good modern evidence of that just go and watch gb news Ooh, Wouldn't it be amazing if we were sitting in front of the television watching some cooking show and the sweet aromas from the food came wafting in through the TV set? Now let's say you're a passionate gourmet addicted to those cooking shows. You may cheer on the Iron Chefs or shout bam with Emeril, but you know you're missing something, the glorious smell of great food. But what if smells could be digitized? Researchers say it is theoretically possible. Scented TV, a weird thought, no? For years, people have been talking about smell vision being able to smell what you're seeing either in a cinema or on your TV or in today's world on your phone. It sounds like a nice idea, but like, what if you're watching Kitchen Nightmares? Smell that then. Smell sound. smell vision was a creation of a man named Hans Lorb and it made its first appearance in 1939 at the New York World's Fair. And the first film to use it was called Mind Traum. So that is to say that smell vision is actually a thing. 
happening, but it was just smells being pumped into a cinema and even that was flawed. So people weren't even that smitten with it. And in terms of hoaxes, it was the bloody BBC again that was behind an April Fool's Day hoax where they claimed that you were going to be able to smell things through your TV set. It was an interview with a professor that started slicing onions and brewing some coffee, claiming that you should be able to smell it at home. And apparently some people called in saying that they could smell it, obviously a placebo effect. smell vision has had a long history in the media and in 1982, John Waters brought out the absolute banger of the film, Polyester, and his own version of smell vision which he called Odorama. I'll be quite blunt with you, Cuddles. I think my marriage is on the wrong. <laughs> And they were basically these little scratch and sniff cards and you can actually buy them on ebay but i'm not sure how good they're gonna smell now the whole idea of smell vision is kind of off-putting but it's also kind of kitschy and if it was real i probably would get it just for a laugh so that's the third tier a lot of april fool's day jokes in this one as always i hope you enjoyed it can you also believe that we're only on the third tier like we've got four more to go it's only going to get weirder and more disturbing from here and on that note i will see you in the next video bye <laughs>